Welcome to the reading of the Sabbath School lesson for the third quarter of 2024. Welcome to the reading of lesson number 11 of the Sabbath School lessons on the book of Mark. This lesson is titled Taken and Tried and is ready for teaching on Sabbath September 14. The author is Dr. Thomas R. Shepherd of Andrews University and your reader today is Dr. Percy Harold. Sabbath afternoon, September 7. Before we start, let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you that Jesus came and he lived this life that showed us how to live and that he taught us about salvation. But this week, as we move into the story of how that salvation came to us, we pray that your Holy Spirit will be here to guide us and to bless us. As we look at Mark towards the end of the book, Lord, it tells this amazing story of how Jesus came and how he actually died for us. And as we open your word, we pray that not only us, but our families and those about us will be blessed from the study of this lesson. And today I'd like to particularly pray for those who are visually impaired or blind who use the podcasts or use the YouTube version to uh, understand more about what the Sabbath School lesson is about so we can be the eyes and the ears for that lesson. I'd particularly like to pray for those who receive these lessons through Christian services for the blind and hearing impaired in the South Pacific Division and through Vision Australia and for those thousands who receive it through Christian Record Services in the North American Division, those listening to the podcast on various apps, those listening on the official General Conference Sabbath School and Personal Ministries app where it's uh, recorded each day, and those watching and listening to these readings on YouTube with the text and the voice synced. Lord, I just pray that everyone who's listening will be blessed today and that we will not only know about Jesus, but we will give our hearts to him and let him be the one that we model after. We pray in Jesus' dear name. Amen. Our memory text this week is Mark chapter 14 and verse 36. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. And Sam, will you read that for us again? And our memory verse is from Mark chapter 14, verse 36. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible for you. Take this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what you will. Chapters 14 to 16 in the book of Mark are known as the Passion Narrative because they describe the suffering, death and resurrection of Jesus. As noted in Lesson 9, the last six chapters of Mark cover only about one week. The majority of events in Mark 14 through to 16 occur on Thursday and Friday of this Passion Week. Jesus' death will occur on Friday and his resurrection on Sunday. This week's lesson focuses on Mark 14, beginning with the fifth sandwich story, which interlinks two opposite actions in relation to Jesus. This is followed by the Last Supper, followed by Jesus' struggle in Gethsemane. There he is arrested and taken before the leaders to be tried. The trial scene is linked with Peter's denial of Jesus, forming the sixth and last of the sandwich stories in Mark. Again, two opposite actions occur, but by an ironic twist, they affirm the same truth. Throughout the narrative, two contrasting story plots march hand in hand. In a crisp style, Mark sets before the reader these clashing plots while revealing the triumph of Jesus. Sunday, September 18, Unforgettable. Read Mark chapter 14, verses 1 to 11. What two stories are intertwined here, and how do they play off of one another? Let's read Mark 14, beginning at verse 1. 
Now the Passover and the festival of unleavened bread were only two days away, and the chief priests and the teachers of the law were scheming to arrest Jesus secretly and kill him. But not during the festival, they said, or the people may riot. While he was in Bethany, reclining at the table in the home of Simon the leper, a woman came with an alabaster jar of very expensive perfume, made of pure nard. She broke the jar and poured the perfume on his head. Some of those present were saying indignantly to one another, Why this waste of perfume? It could have been sold for more than a year's wages, and the money given to the poor. And they rebuked her harshly. Leave her alone, said Jesus. Why are you bothering her? She has done a beautiful thing to me. The poor you will always have with you, and you can help them any time you want, but you will not always have me. She did what she could. She poured perfume on my body beforehand to prepare for my burial. Truly, I tell you, Wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Then Judas Iscariot, one of the twelve, went to the chief priests to betray Jesus to them. They were delighted to hear this and promised to give him money, so he watched for an opportunity to hand him over. Mark 14 verse 1 indicates that the Passover was two days away. This meeting probably occurred on either Tuesday night or Wednesday of that week. The religious leaders had a plan and a timing. They just need a means to accomplish their goal. It will come from a surprising quarter. This passage is the fifth sandwich story in Mark. We saw the first one in Lesson 3. The story of the plot against Jesus is linked with a story of a woman who anoints Jesus' head with precious perfume. Two parallel characters do opposite actions, displaying an ironic contrast. Who the woman is here is not revealed by Mark. Her amazing gift to Jesus stands in contrast to Judas's perfidy in betraying his Lord. She is unnamed, he is named as one of the twelve. The value of the gift is listed. His price is only a promise of money. No specific reason is given for why she does this, but the guests at the dinner are appalled by what they consider a grand waste of close to a year's wages in pouring out the perfume on Jesus. Jesus, however, interposes in her defence and says that what she has done will be included in gospel proclamation throughout the world as a memorial to her. It is unforgettable. Indeed, all four gospels tell this story in one form or another, probably because of Jesus' words memorialising her deed. Judas's betrayal also is unforgettable. Mark implies that his motive was greed. The Gospel of John makes it explicit in John chapter 12, verses 4 to 6. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, who was later to betray him, objected. Why wasn't this perfume sold and the money given to the poor? It was worth a year's wages. He did not say this because he cared about the poor, but because he was a thief. As keeper of the money bag, he used to help himself to what was put into it. Mark contains a play on the word good in order to illustrate that two different motives or plots are in play in these stories. Jesus calls the woman's action good or beautiful in verse 6 of Mark 14. He says you can always do good for the poor in verse 7. In verse 9 he calls her deed part of the good news gospel. In verse 11, Judas looks for a good opportunity to betray Jesus. What this play on words suggests is that the plot of men to destroy the Messiah will actually become part of the gospel story because it brings to fruition the will of God in giving his Son for the salvation of humanity. And so to finish the day, how does Romans 8.28 help explain what will happen here. 
Romans 8.28 And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Monday, September 9, The Last Supper Read Mark chapter 14, verses 22 to 31, and Exodus 24, verse 8. What great significance to the Christian faith is found in this account? First of all, we read Mark 14, beginning at verse 22. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take it, this is my body. Then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, he said to them. Truly, I tell you, I will not drink again from the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. When they had sung a hymn, they went out to the Mount of Olives. You will all fall away, Jesus told them, for it is written, I will strike the shepherd and the sheep will be scattered. But after I have risen, I will go ahead of you into Galilee. Peter declared, Even if all fall away, I will not. Truly I tell you, Jesus answered, Today, yes, tonight, before the rooster crows twice, you yourself will disown me three times. But Peter insisted emphatically, Even if I have to die with you, I will never disown you. And all the others said the same. And then Exodus 24 verse 8. Moses then took the blood, sprinkled it on the people and said, This is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Mark 14.12 notes that this is the first day of unleavened bread when the Passover lamb was sacrificed. The meal was on Thursday evening. At the Last Supper, Jesus institutes a new memorial service. It is a transition from the Jewish Passover celebration and is directly linked to Israel's leaving Egypt and becoming God's covenant people at Sinai. In the sealing of the covenant in Exodus 20 verse 8, Moses sprinkles the people with the blood of the sacrifices and says, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. It is striking that in the Lord's Supper, which Jesus institutes here, no use is made of the lamb of the Passover meal. That is because Jesus is the Lamb of God. As you read in John 1.29, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, Look, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The bread of the Lord's Supper represents his body. The new covenant is sealed with the blood of Jesus and the cup represents this. And we compare here Jeremiah 31 verses 31 to 34. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt, because they broke my covenant, though I was a husband to them, declares the Lord. This is the covenant I will make with the people of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. No longer will they teach their neighbour or say to one another, Know the Lord, because they will all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their wickedness and will remember their sins no more. He says in Mark 14.24, This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many. Then, amid all this, Jesus predicts that his disciples will all abandon him. He cites Zechariah 13.7, which speaks of the sword striking the shepherd and the sheep being scattered. Zechariah 13.7 reads, Awake, sword, against my shepherd, against the man who is close to me, declares the Lord Almighty. Strike the shepherd, and the sheep will be scattered, and I will turn my hand against the little ones. 
Jesus is the shepherd and his disciples are the sheep. It is a stark and depressing message. But Jesus adds a word of hope, repeating the prediction of his resurrection. But he adds that he will go before the disciples to Galilee. That prediction will be referred to by the young man at Jesus' tomb in Mark 16 verse 7, and thus it carries special weight here. And in Mark 16 verse 7 we read, But go tell his disciples and Peter, He is going ahead of you into Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. But all this is too hard for the disciples to accept, especially Peter, who argues that everyone else may fall away, but he will not. However, Jesus continues with the solemn language and predicts that Peter will deny him three times, before the rooster crows twice. The prediction will play a crucial role in the scene of Jesus' trial and Peter's denial. So it also plays a crucial role here. And to finish the day, what can you learn from whatever times you promised God that you would or would not do something and ended up doing or not doing it anyway? Tuesday, September 10, Gethsemane. Read Mark chapter 14, verses 32 to 42. What did Jesus pray in Gethsemane, and how was the prayer answered? Mark chapter 14, beginning at verse 32. They went to a place called Gethsemane, and Jesus said to his disciples, Sit here while I pray. He took Peter, James, and John along with him, and he began to be deeply distressed and troubled. My soul is overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death, he said to them, stay here and keep watch. Going a little farther, he fell to the ground and prayed that, if possible, the hour might pass from him. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. Then he returned to his disciples and found them sleeping. Simon, he said to Peter, are you asleep? Couldn't you keep watch for one hour? Watch and pray so that you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more he went away and prayed the same thing. When he came back, he again found them sleeping because their eyes were heavy. They did not know what to say to him. Returning the third time, he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Enough. The hour has come. Look, the Son of Man is delivered into the hands of sinners. Rise, let us go. Here comes my betrayer. Leaving the walled city of Jerusalem, where they ate the Passover meal, Jesus and his disciples go across the Kidron Valley to a garden on the slopes of the Mount of Olives. The name Gethsemane means oil press, suggesting that there was an olive oil processing press in the vicinity. The exact location is unknown because the Romans cut down all the trees on the Mount of Olives during the siege of AD 70. As Peter enters the garden, he leaves his disciples there and goes farther with Peter, James and John. But then he leaves these three as well and proceeds further by himself. This spatial distancing suggests Jesus is becoming more and more isolated as he faces his upcoming suffering. Jesus prays for the cup of suffering to be removed, but only if it is God's will as you read in Mark 14, verse 36. Abba, Father, he said, everything is possible for you. Take this cup from me, yet not what I will, but what you will. He uses the Aramaic term Abba, which Mark translates as Father. The term does not mean Daddy, as some have suggested. The term used by a child to address his father was Abbi, not Abba. However, the use of the term Abba, father, does carry the close familial linkage which should not be diminished. 
What Jesus prays for is the removal of the cup of suffering, but he submits himself to the will of God. Compare with the Lord's Prayer in Matthew 6 verse 10, Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. It became obvious throughout the rest of the Passion narrative that God's answer to Jesus' prayer is no. He will not remove the cup of suffering because through that experience salvation is offered to the world. When you face hardships, it is encouraging to have friends who support you. In Philippians 4.13, Paul talks about doing all things through the one who strengthens him. I can do all this through him who gives me strength, it reads. Many forget Philippians 4.14, where the apostle begins, Nevertheless, it reads, Nevertheless, it was kind of you to share my troubles. This is what Jesus desired in Gethsemane. Three times he came seeking comfort from his disciples. Three times they were sleeping. At the end, he arouses them to go forth with him to face the trial. He is ready. They are not. Wednesday, September 11, Leaving All to Flee from Jesus Read Mark chapter 14, verses 43 to 52. What happens here that is so crucial to the plan of salvation? Mark 14, beginning at verse 43. Just as he was speaking, Judas, one of the twelve, appeared. With him was a crowd armed with swords and clubs sent from the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and the elders. Now, the betrayer had arranged a signal with them. The one I kiss is the man. Arrest him and lead him away under guard. Going at once to Jesus, Judas said, Rabbi, and kissed him. The men seized Jesus and arrested him. Then one of those standing near drew his sword and struck the servant of the high priest, cutting off his ear. Am I leading a rebellion, said Jesus, that you have come out with swords and clubs to capture me? Every day I was with you, teaching in the temple courts, and you did not arrest me. But the scriptures must be fulfilled. Then everyone deserted him and fled. A young man, wearing nothing but a linen garment, was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. It is shocking that one of Jesus' closest associates betrayed him to his enemies. The Gospels do not go into great detail about Judas's motivation. But Ellen G. White writes in The Desire of Ages, page 716, Judas had naturally a strong love for money, but he had not always been corrupt enough to do such a deed as this. He had fostered the evil spirit of avarice until it had become the ruling motive of his life. The love of mammon overbalanced his love for Christ. Through becoming the slave of one vice, he gave himself to Satan to be driven to any lengths in sin. End of quote. Betrayal in itself is deplored by all, even by those who make use of betrayers. Let's compare Matthew 27 verses 3 to 7. When Judas, who had betrayed him, saw that Jesus was condemned, he was seized with remorse and returned the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders. I have sinned, he said, for I have betrayed innocent blood. What is that to us? they replied. That's your responsibility. So Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. The chief priests picked up the coins and said, It is against the law to put this into the treasury since it is blood money. So they decided to use the money to buy the potter's field as a burial place for foreigners. But Judas's deed is particularly nefarious because he seeks to hide his betrayal under the guise of friendship. He gives the crowd instruction that the man he kisses is the man to arrest. 
It appears that Judas wanted to hide his perfidy from Jesus and the other disciples. Chaos breaks out when the crowd arrests Jesus. Someone draws a sword, John 18, 10 and 11 says it was Peter, and cuts off the ear of the high priest's servant. Let's read that in John 18, verse 10 onwards. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, Put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup the Father has given me? Jesus addresses the mob, chastising them for doing in secret what they were afraid to do in the open when he was teaching in the temple. But Jesus ends with a reference to the scriptures being fulfilled. It is another signal of that dual plot running through the Passion narrative, that the will of God is coming to fulfilment even as the will of man works to destroy the Messiah. The disciples all flee, including Peter, who nevertheless will reappear following Jesus at a distance and ending up getting himself in trouble. But Mark fourteen fifty one and 52 tells of a young man following Jesus, an account found here and nowhere else in the canonical Gospels. And that reads, A young man wearing nothing but a linen garment was following Jesus. When they seized him, he fled naked, leaving his garment behind. Some think it was Mark himself, but that is unprovable. What is remarkable is that he runs away naked. The young man, instead of leaving all to follow Jesus, leaves all to flee from Jesus. And so to finish today, think about the fearful idea that being a slave of only one vice led Judas to do what he did. What should this tell us about hating sin and, by God's grace, overcoming it? Thursday, September 12. Who are you? Read Mark chapter 14, verses 60 to 72. Compare how Jesus responded to events in contrast to how Peter did. What lessons can we learn from the differences? Mark 14, beginning at verse 60. Then the high priest stood up before them and asked Jesus, Are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and gave no answer. Again the high priest asked him, Are you the Messiah, the Son of the Blessed One? I am, said Jesus, and you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the Mighty One and coming on the clouds of heaven. The high priest tore his clothes. Why do we need any more witnesses, he asked. You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? They all condemned him as worthy of death. Then some began to spit at him. They blindfolded him, struck him with their fists, and said, Prophesy! And the guards took him and beat him. While Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came by. When she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him. You also were with that Nazarene Jesus, she said. But he denied it. I don't know or understand what you're talking about, he said, and went out into the entryway. When the servant girl saw him there, she said again to those standing around, This fellow is one of them. Again he denied it. After a little while, those standing near said to Peter, Surely you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. He began to call down curses, and he swore to them, I don't know this man you're talking about. Immediately the rooster crowed the second time. Then Peter remembered the words Jesus had spoken to him. Before the rooster crows twice, you will disown me three times. And he broke down and wept. 
Mark 14, verses 53 to 59, describes Jesus being brought to the Sanhedrin in the first part of the trial. It is an exercise in frustration. Let's read that part of the story too. They took Jesus to the high priest, and all the chief priests, the elders, and the teachers of the law came together. Peter followed him at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any. Many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. Then some stood and gave this false testimony against him. We heard him say, I will destroy this temple made with human hands, and in three days will build another not made with hands. Yet even then their testimony did not agree. Again and again the leaders tried to make their accusation against Jesus stick. The Gospel writer notes how the testimony was false and the witnesses never agreed. Finally, the high priest arises and addresses Jesus directly. At first, Jesus does not respond, but then the high priest places him under oath, before God. And we read about that in Matthew twenty six sixty three. But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God, tell us if you are the Messiah, the Son of God and asks the direct question if he is the Messiah. Jesus frankly and openly admits that he is, and then references Daniel 7 verses 13 and 14 regarding the Son of Man as seated at God's right hand and coming with the clouds of heaven. This is too much for the high priest. Daniel 7 verses 13 and 14 read, in my vision at night I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the Ancient of Days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and peoples of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom is one that will never be destroyed." This is too much for the high priest who tears his robes and calls for Jesus' condemnation, which the council immediately gives. The leaders begin to shame Jesus by spitting on him, covering his face, beating him, and calling on him to prophesy. While Jesus is inside, being tried and given a faithful testimony, Peter is outside giving a lying report. This is the sixth and final sandwich story in Mark, and here the irony is particularly pointed. Here are two parallel characters, Jesus and Peter, doing opposite actions. Jesus gives a faithful testimony, Peter a false one. Three times Peter is accosted by a servant or bystanders, and each time he denies association with Jesus, even cursing and swearing in the process. It is at this point that a rooster crows a second time, and Peter suddenly remembers Jesus' prophecy that he would deny his Lord three times that very night. He breaks down and weeps. Here is the striking irony. At the end of his trial, Jesus is blindfolded and struck and commanded to prophesy. The idea was to mock him, since he could not see who struck him. However, at the very time they do this, Peter is denying Jesus in the courtyard below, fulfilling one of Jesus' prophecies. Consequently, in denying Jesus, Peter demonstrates that Jesus is the Messiah. And so to finish the day, what words of hope would you give to someone who, though wanting to follow Jesus, fails at times to do so? Who of us has not, at times, failed to follow what we know Jesus wants?
Friday, September 13. From the book The Desire of Ages, page 712 and 713, we read, While the degrading oaths were fresh upon Peter's lips, and the shrill crowing of the cock was still ringing in his ears, the Saviour turned from the frowning judges and looked full upon his poor disciple. At the same time, Peter's eyes were drawn to his master. In that gentle countenance, he read deep pity and sorrow, but there was no anger there. The sight of that pale, suffering face, those quivering lips, that look of compassion and forgiveness, pierced his heart like an arrow. Conscience was aroused, memory was active. Peter called to mind his promise of a few short hours before that he would go with his Lord to prison and to death. He remembered his grief when the Saviour told him in the upper chamber that he would deny his Lord thrice that same night. Peter had just declared that he knew not Jesus, but he now realised with bitter grief how well his Lord knew him and how accurately he had read his heart, the falseness of which was unknown even to himself. End of quote. And that brings us to our five discussion questions for this week. One, how by merely reading what Jesus predicted in Mark 14 verse 9, are we seeing another of Jesus' predictions? A highly unlikely prediction given the circumstances in which it had been uttered, actually being fulfilled. Let's read that, Mark 14, verse 9. Truly, I tell you, wherever the gospel is preached throughout the world, what she has done will also be told in memory of her. Question 2. Compare and contrast Judas and Peter. How were they alike, and how different in the way they acted in the Passion narrative? 3. Discuss the meaning of the Lord's Supper. How can we make this more meaningful in our church and involve more members in its celebration? 4. Discuss the fact that God said no to Jesus' prayer in Gethsemane. What does it mean when God says no to us? And 5. Though Peter greatly failed Jesus with his denials, Jesus did not cast him off. What hope can you take for yourself from this fact? And now it's time for Inside Story with Sibylla Harold. Thank you, Sibylla. Fulfilling a Dream About Tofu by Andrew McChesney Father developed stomach problems and Mother and Anoush decided to pay close attention to his diet. Anoush was a vegetarian and Mother, a biologist by training, knew which foods were healthy. But they had not sought to place the healthiest foods on the family table. Mother and Anoush began to feed father mostly plant-based meals, and the stomach problems went away. Then father had another dream. He saw a bright light in the garage. It was so bright that he couldn't look at it. Do not be afraid, said a voice from the light. Come, take this bucket with seeds and plant them on this table. Father saw a bucket of seeds beside a stainless steel table. But the command made no sense. As a university student, he had trained to become an agricultural scientist, so he knew plants. But even without that knowledge, he knew that seeds couldn't sprout on steel. Seeds have to be planted in the ground, he protested. The voice did not waver. Do as I say, it said. Still in the dream, a day passed and father saw healthy three-inch shoots growing from the table. He was shocked. What's going on, he asked. How can seeds grow in one night and on this stainless steel table? You need to pull up the green shoots and sell them, the voice said. Father related the dream to his family. As Anush listened, she wondered if God was telling Father to make tofu. There was no company that made tofu in Armenia. Father was a business owner with agricultural training and Anush was sure that he could do it. But she didn't want to try to interpret his dream. She prayed for Father to hear God's call directly. Then Anush participated in a medical missionary conference in Ukraine. 
the 300 participants grew excited when they heard about Father's dream. It was 2019 and Adventists had flourishing tofu production facilities and health food stores in the country. When the conference organiser asked who would be willing to teach Father to make tofu, everyone raised their hands. Two months later, Father bought plane tickets to Ukraine. Like Abraham and Sarah, he and Mother left home without knowing exactly where they were going. God organised everything. Medical missionaries from the conference met them at the airport. Father and Mother stayed with them as they visited Adventist health food stores and tofu facilities for 12 days. Father saw Christians could work not only for money, but also for God's glory. He was impressed. He returned home and opened Armenia's first tofu company. Anush was overjoyed. She was amazed to think that Father had once used her vegetarian lifestyle as a reason to bar her from going to church, and now he was selling tofu and promoting a vegetarian lifestyle.